1 Peter chapter 5. Classic passage, verses 5 through 7, we will read again on humility. Verse 5, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, last lesson on humility is incredibly important that I hope that uh, you took to heart and that will be helpful to you. Now, um, in this lesson, we're going to get a little bit more general. All right? We're going to get a little bit more general. So, in humility, uh, there's a lot of times that there's a lot of dissension and fighting. The Bible says, with pride cometh contention. Yeah. Uh, Bible-believing churches are the most contentious when it does not have to be. It does not have to be that way, but it always ends up that way. And we've got to break uh, this horrible thing that's infecting us Bible believers. That's right. So this contention, how can it be broken? Well, this is the problem. The world teaches you that in order to break off the contention, and apostate churches are teaching you how to break off the contention, is to tolerate, see? That's the reason why those churches are growing more, and Bible-believing churches are getting smaller. Why? Because doctrine does divide. Doctrine does divide. Now, the problem is this, though, is that we've got to make sure that the doctrine itself, the Word of God, that truth itself is the one that divides, but not our flesh. That's right. Not our flesh. So, uh, when we look at uh, Galatians, so keep your hand here, all right, because there's a good chance we might go back here. But I want you to go to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And then I want you to go to Romans chapter 16. Romans 16 and Galatians 5. So, the world's uh, way of thinking is that we have to tolerate. So then, when wrong doctrine is being taught, they make a big deal about not making a big deal out of it. And then when they hammer that into your head, that's the reason why they wonder why their current generation is falling to the liberal agenda, to the woke agenda. The reason why is simply because you've trained them to constantly tolerate, see? To constantly tolerate differences. And what happens is that increases even more through habit if you teach them from a young child. If you teach them that about toleration from a young child, they become much worse than you in toleration. So then that's why they end up with every religion's okay, every lifestyle is okay, and everything is okay. Let's just, why can't we all live along happily ever after? Because it doesn't end up happily ever after. When you tolerate different doctrines or wrong doctrine, that means you're tolerating sin itself. Yep. So that's important to understand. Doctrine is the only thing that distinguishes what's right and wrong. Right. All right? Well, I mean, like, what's wrong with LGBTQ+. Can't say that it's immoral, it's wrong. You have to say why it's right and wrong, not because of humanism or uh, man's way of ethics or philosophy. It's because what did God say? That's right. When you look at what God said in His Word, that's called a doctrine. A doctrine is a belief or a teaching that comes out from what God says. Doctrine is the only thing that keeps this world sane. It's the only thing that keeps our sanity together to tell the difference of what's right and wrong. Good. So truth must divide. Doctrine must divide. That's inevitable. Uh, that's the reason why you have to be careful of this, is that um, what the problem is, which you don't want to get down to. Now, I don't think you have this problem uh, yet, but I do know pastors do get this problem later on. So, one is that the disgust of division leads to the other extreme, which is toleration or tolerance. When we get over there, then you're on dangerous ground. Now, the guilty thing I've noticed with uh, some Bible-believing churches is that 
when they start to fellowship more with people who are not Bible believers, then that fellowship, the Bible says, evil communications corrupt good manners. Yeah, wow. The Bible says a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Their watered down life or their weakening of doctrine will affect them. So then that Bible believing pastor will water down and weaken his doctrine too. Okay, it's one thing about yourself, but you have to realize this. What you do in uh, moderation, your family or your members will do to the extremity. So think about it. If the members see what the pastor is doing in fellowshipping or tolerating, see, the watered-down doctrine with other pastors, then what's going to happen is the members will think that pastor is okay. Then they're going to listen to that pastor's teaching and stuff or fellowship with their members. And then what's going to happen is your members will be way more watered down than you. The only reason why you're not watered down is because, one, you already know too much, or two, you've been trained in a good Bible-believing environment. Don't you want to give that same good Bible-believing environment to your people? So that's important to understand. Bible-believing pastors and churches are guilty of that. Now, uh, I'm not nitpicky, all right? Look, in times there are situations that you do have to tolerate in your fellowship. A lot of people, uh, this is uh, just basic doctrine, so I don't really have to get there. For example, you have unsafe family members. What are you going to do? Not eat with them? So they're not Bible believers. What are you going to do? No, I cannot eat at a restaurant with you? Of course not. So there are sometimes uh, unsafe family members or loved ones or neighbors who are not Bible believers like you. Depending on the situation and scenarios, you have to fellowship, but with boundaries, right? Yep. With boundaries. As a Bible-believing pastor, it's the same thing too. It's inevitable. There are some ministries that we do. Nursing home ministry. If we're going to go inside a nursing home, do you think that the nursing home workers are all Bible believers? Obviously not. So there are times that you have to uh, connect with them, talk with them, but do it by boundaries. See? So it's the same thing with me as a pastor. There are times that I'm going to have to hang out with ministries who may not be Bible-believing. Why? Because the reason why is it depends on the goal and it also depends on the situation. Right. You have to look at the goal and the situation. Yep. So, uh, for example, I worked at the Salvation Army Ministries. They're like completely, uh, you know, apostate and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. However, the, uh, when I talk to the workers over there and everybody, I have boundaries. And then that goal is to just simply lead those people to Christ and then give them basic doctrine. If any of them come to my church, I give them Bible believing truth. See that? So you have to look at the intention, the goal. Let's say you're going to a big missions meeting, all right, and you're meeting with other missionaries. You're going to work together with them. You're probably going to spread the gospel everywhere, right? But then there's some missionary over there who may not be Bible believing. Well, that's not a time and a place where you correct that person in, you know, right doctrine or good, teach them preacher. dispensationalism. Wow. Wow. The goal of that time yeah, is no. to just spread the gospel with them. Okay? So you always have to look at the goal on why you fellowship with them. That's you good. have to have boundaries. And then the third thing, you have to look at the situation. All right? You always have to look at the situation. Um, now, this might be extreme for some people, and they say, I would never do this. But think about this, all right? If um, one of these globalists that you just really despise and hate, okay, and then let's just put um, Dr. Smell Fungus, all right? You know who I'm talking about, right? But Dr. Smell Fungus, let's pretend, let's pretend that, a, mem uh, that a, a son of Dr. Smell Fungus is a member of our church, became a Bible believer. Do you think then we're going to pound on that son Hey, you better separate from your father because he's an evil villain and a globalist. No. See, that's not something you can tell that son, obviously. Right. Because that, that, uh, that's his father. Yeah. So obviously he's going to be at that father's home, fellowship with him, eat out or something like that. So you have situations like that, you have to look at the situation. When you look at a situation, you can tell when you can fellowship, when not. 
But these should be basic stuff, okay? This is not part of advance, all right? This should be basic stuff. But what I want to encourage, again, I say this quite often, is that please look at beginner's discipleship. Yeah. My lesson on fellowship and separation, right. and then the one. second one is judging others. Praise God. If you look at that, it will be life-changing to you. Now, concerning about the advanced topic, uh, Bible-believing pastors, they might have that in their minds, right? They may look at the goal, they may look at the situation, and then uh, 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 they'll have boundaries set up. But what they do not think about is this. What they do not think about is when they have these three things, are they keeping them well? Hmm. Are they guarding them well? Because they forget, a one, fellowship brings influence even unconsciously. That's extremely important to understand. I make a very big deal who I fellowship, who I don't fellowship with. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I make it a big deal when I have fellowship, how much I can fellowship, how much I don't fellowship. The only people who will understand this are pastors who've grown for many years in the ministry and have dealt with wrong influence from other pastors. They're the only people who understand that. But surprisingly, there are such a good number of pastors who still don't understand that. Yeah. So you have to put a bound, uh, not just a boundary, but you have to put a distance. Yeah. All right. So influence. All right. Fellowship brings influence unconsciously. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful of that. Mm -hmm. The second thing is this. The second thing that a lot of pastors and experienced, uh, so-called experienced Bible believers don't keep in mind, which is part of the advanced lesson, is that they don't think about the other people they're affecting. Yeah. So they may have the boundary, they may know the situation, and then uh, they, know the ba they keep the boundaries, they know the situation, and everything else, but the problem is what about their sheep? What about their family? They don't have that kind of growth or maturity. Yeah. You have to think about them. When you think about them, they're going to be following your example and they're going to tend to do more extreme than you. So that is the problem with, I have to say, with Bible-believing pastors today. That's so important to understand. All right? Believe it or not, now some of you might be in shock, which is why it's part of advanced lesson. There are some people I fellowship with that other Bible-believing pastors wouldn't dare fellowship with. And there are pastors that Bible believe that those other Bible believing pastors fellowship with that I wouldn't dare fellowship with. Why is that? Because everybody's situations and That's their good. churches and their people, their family, they're all different. So because of that, there's gonna be good reasons why I can fellowship, why I cannot fellowship. Alright, for example, I can fellowship with the Calvinist or you know, maybe even the Catholic at the Salvation Army Ministry, all right? With, you know, obviously with the boundaries, with the right goals, all right? So I could probably fellowship for the opportunity to witness to those people, right? right? But those Bible-believing pastors shouldn't, should have no business fellowshipping with those guys. Why? Because they're not running a Salvation Army Ministry like I am. <laughs> if they're in another part of a state. And if I see them fellowshipping at some convention together, I know there's something rotten going on. They're probably uh, holding hands with some Calvinist wrong doctrine or Catholic wrong doctrine then, right? Yeah. So see, that's why everybody's situation is different. You have to understand when it concerns about who you fellowship with, who you separate from. So those are important factors uh, to keep in mind. Now, this is all part of basics, but I kind of advanced it a bit. But remember this, the problem with the pastors is they don't keep in mind why they hit the tolerance level is because they're very disgusted with the division, all right? And that is very true, and I'll get into that. You never want to hit here. Never, ever, ever, okay? How you can guard yourself and keep yourself in track are in two ways, all right? Like I told you before, is you have to think about how much it's influencing you. You have to think about that. You have to guard, especially your unconscious state. All right, Consciously, you think you might be in control, but there are some words that you're saying in your preaching yeah. Yeah. that you're repeating from the person you're fellowshipping with. Mm, come on. Yep. And you never thought about that. All right. Wow. Uh, another thing is you might be pastoring the methods in a way in your church that you've gotten from your pastor friend there. 
So see, you have to be very careful of that, all right? I'm not saying you can't, uh, you can't pick good stuff from other pastors. Look, even wrong doctrine pastors, you can pick good stuff from them, okay? You can. I mean, they're not completely evil, all right? How they deceive people is that they have some good stuff, all right? Exactly. That's how they deceive people. So you can concentrate on the good and only get the good from them. I get that. But we have to realize that you have to at least put a guard. That's my point, all right? I'm not saying totally avoid, but at least have a guard. They drop the guard. That's the bottom line. They drop the guard. Because they're thinking, well, I can fellowship because, because what? Oh, because they believe the King James Bible like me. They don't believe everything like I do, but it's okay that I can do that. No, that's bad. That's bad. That's a bad conclusion. All right? Why do you fellowship with that KJV only pastor? Maybe it's because, oh, because they're doing a ministry that's similar to mine about um, reaching the homeless. So I could partner with that person. We could work together because they have the resources and they can help me on that. Okay, that's different. See that? Yeah. So remember, you always have to... Uh, you always have to keep in mind about the basis of your fellowship as well, all right? So in order to avoid the tolerance, you have to look at the influence, and you always have to keep your guard on it, okay? So keep your guard, and then beware of how much it's influencing you, and then you have to beware how much it's affecting or even influencing others, you're responsible for. Now, you don't want to be held accountable for them at the judgment seat of Christ for your uh, dumb mistake. Yeah. So it's so important to keep these two things in mind. So d just don't tolerate easily. That's my point, all right? Look, if you're tolerating based on good reasons or something like that, I get it, all right? So everybody's ministry is going to run differently. So that's not what I'm getting at, though, okay? So what I'm getting at is in your toleration, you have just at least keep these two things in mind, all right? As long as you keep these two things in mind, then you should be safe, you should be fine, and I don't have a problem. But I do have a problem when people just think, well, I can tolerate so-and-so because of, because of what? Well, you know, they don't believe all the right doctrines like I do, but they believe King James Bible is perfect. They, uh, they're independent Baptists like me. They may not believe dispensationalism like I do, but let's see, that's the problem, all right? I do not like that, right. all right? You always have to realize this, is that when you're tolerating people, there's got to be good basis for it. Uh, a good basis, for example, is you don't have a Bible-believing church near you, right? And the only church that you have is a King James-only church that's probably halfway dispensational. Why, then that should be a church you should attend, to be that's honest. Right. Not separate and then get scared and run off. No, church, uh, like I told you, a B-grade church, even though it's not A-grade, is far better than F-grade, which right. is what? Flesh, yeah. okay, yourself, all right? That's so right. it's always better. But if you have an A-grade church, see that? If you have an A-grade church that you can attend, why are you, you should be attending that church, shouldn't you? That's right. Uh, a problem with people is that their toleration, see, they tolerate things too easily. That's one thing I don't like. You should never uh, tolerate things so easily. You shouldn't have your own standards of toleration right. about which beliefs you can tolerate, which beliefs you couldn't. To be honest, this is my best advice. You know how you should do toleration? You don't tolerate anything. You need near perfection. Right. You need perfection, to be honest. Well, that's impossible, even in our church, right? Yeah. All right? right? So no one's perfect. So you go for the crowd that's closest to perfection. Mm -hmm. It's that simple, all right? But a lot of people, they ditch the closest to perfection for the standard that's going much lower in perfection. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Christian life should never be that way, mm -hmm. all right? Our Christian life should always be striving for perfection, yeah. hanging around people for perfection. We should always be that way. We should never lose that kind of goal in our lives. Okay? We must always do that. So the problem uh, with uh, the Bible believers is that because of the disgust of division, that's why they do that toleration. You should never do that. Now, when I'm coming back here about humility, here's the thing. The danger of this, all right, the danger of this 
due to fighting and dissensions of Bible believers. Why? Perfection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, that's our standard. We should go for that. Amen. Yeah. But, but my goodness, you every uh, yeah. Bible believers are the ho most horrible people I have ever met. Who uh, who strive for perfection, but they don't know how to handle it. That's right. If that makes any sense to you. Romans 14 is the beginning lesson of beginner's discipleship that Bible believers still don't know how to use it. Romans 14 is what? Everyone has different spiritual convictions, right? Yeah. Like I told you, there's going to be differences among Bible-believing pastors and ministries how they run. Yeah. But the problem is this. There's so much into their own spiritual conviction, they judge other Bible-believing pastors if they don't follow their yeah. spiritual conviction. Yeah. Now look, if it's doctrine, that's one thing, but when it comes to your spiritual conviction, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Right. No one is going to be perfect like you because you ain't perfect. That's right. right. That's, true. I, that's the problem. With the, that, that makes me stinking angry, okay? And you wonder why you're sick and tired of seeing other Bible believe. You know what the extreme is? Come on. The extreme is two things. Yeah. You get the ones who are the perfectionist crowd, and then you get the ones who are the tolerating crowd. Yeah. yeah. Two sides. Yeah. Wow. Now that's what I'm seeing all over Bible believing churches and even pastors. And you you cannot. Uh, what did Pastor Dennis Knowles preach yeah. teach about? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. A yeah. false yeah. balance yeah. is an abomination yeah. to the Lord. Yeah. We have a tendency. This is our problem. Our tendency is when we see something that turns us off or disgusts us, it makes us go to the other extreme. Yeah. All the time. That's how our thinking, our choices are made. Why? Well, because I see something bad out there. That's the reason why I cannot do that. And then that's why you end up to the other extreme. There is no excuse for you to go to the other extreme. You have to remember that. If you always make that as your excuse, then you're going to repeat a humane cycle where no one's going to live in a balanced life for the Lord. Yeah. We have to hit somewhere here all the time, all right? We have to hit the balance here. In order for us to reach that balance, now we come to number two, the disgust of the division. I've told you about that. Never, uh, never end up there, okay? Never end up there. Don't, uh, for humility, Humility does not mean tolerance. Let me repeat that again. Humility does not mean tolerance. That's the problem with us. Uh, the majority of the people in the world, including some Bible-believing pastors, the reason why they get along, listen, the reason why they get along well with all different camps is probably not because they're humble. It's because they're tolerating people. They'll say like, well, there's some stuff that they know that I don't know. Some stuff that they have that I could learn from and stuff like that. That does sound like a humble person. But you, this is their problem. Their problem is they don't think about these other two things again, what they're doing. Do they think about how much influence it, that they're receiving? The influence that they're giving to other people they're responsible for. So they don't have that guard up. That's the problem with those people who are just tolerating people. You gotta, it's not a sign of humility, even though they think that it's a sign of humility. It's not. When you do that, then you're not going to put a standard somewhere. See? You're not going to put a standard somewhere. I'll tell you who you should be doing that. You should be doing that to the crowd that's near perfect. See? That's closest to perfection that the Lord put in your life. Those are the people that you should uh, put the Toleration Act. The intolerance should apply to the people who are not striving for perfection. The ones who are uh, near perfect, close to perfection with you, those are the people you want to tolerate. But then the godless, depraved, wicked world, you know, you shouldn't tolerate that. Come on. The ones who are apostate, you shouldn't tolerate that. The ones who are watered down, you shouldn't tolerate that. You got to tolerate the ones who are closest to perfection for you. Right. You have to tolerate those people. And then the Lord could use that in your life. Praise God. Um, the reason why you should uh, tolerate those who are closest to perfect for you is this. is because whom did God 
give to you in your life? Whom did God give to you? Now let me give you a good example here. Now, if you look at uh, Martin Luther's teachings, I'll be honest, if some of you looked it up, a lot of it is just heretical, yeah. believe it or not. A lot of it is just heretical. A lot of it you want to avoid with the 10-foot pole, he's anti-Semite. Yeah. Now, there are some uh, Bible-believing uh, preachers who believe that Luther's not saved, <laughs> or like a lot of the other Great Awakening revival preachers aren't saved, they're burning in hell. Now, I don't go that far. Yeah. I don't go that far. Uh, I'll be interested to hear their side of the story and stuff like that and think about it, but me, I don't go that far. Sorry. Why is it that uh, in church history, uh, you'll see me giving Luther a break, right? But then I don't give people like John MacArthur a break. John MacArthur probably would be more right in doctrine than Luther, believe it or not, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, why is it that I would cut Luther a break, not MacArthur? The key is this. The key is is that whom did God give, if you're a Bible believer during that time, yeah. who's the closest crowd to you that time, right? Mm -hmm. So then, if you like pick up the closest crowd to you that time, then, then let's say it will be Luther right here. Then if that's the closest crowd the Lord gave to you, then me, I'd work on toleration right here, see? But then let's say there's another person you're comparing to right here, all right? Who's like KJV only, <laughs> dispensational, whatever, all right? Bible believer. If there's this person that's been there all that time, but you never tolerated that person, you always criticize that person, you always look down upon that person, you would never fellowship with that person, but you're fellowshipping with a person like that, I have a problem with you. I have a problem with you. You're wasting good fellowship the Lord gave to you for class D or something like that, or a C grade. See, that shows how much they lowered their standards of perfection. That's good. That's how much they lowered their standards of perfection right there. So you have to look at whom did God give to you. That's why, do you understand, some missionaries in foreign lands, they're not going to get like this kind of crowd where they're at, right? So who they fellowship with is going to be far different from me, who I fellowship yeah, with. That's good. Some people might say, why don't you fellowship with so-and-so and so-and-so? -so? They're nearby you and stuff like that. Because I don't want that. That's right. And trust me, they wouldn't want me either. All right? <laughs> right. Some of them, I heard they call me a devil. Okay? <laughs> Even though we're King James only, independent Baptist. All right? But some of them call me a devil. I didn't go that far. All right? <laughs> so I think it's best that we, I just leave them with their work. They leave my work alone. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So, we have, so people might judge me for who I fellowship, who I separate. None of your beeswax. You don't know why. All right? Amen. So that's the reason why you have to understand everyone's going to be different in that. So when you're tolerating... Who did God give to you? If God gave you a Bible-believing church, Bible-believing pastor, Bible-believing brethren, yeah. you, you got to realize this. you got to separate them yeah. from B or C class Christians and stick with A grade class. That's right. Why? Because God wants the best out of you, the perfect out of you. Right. But if you settle for B standard, God sees your standard then. Yeah. And that's a sin. Yep. That's a sin, okay? It's a sin to do that. God wants perfect out of you. God wants perfect out of your life. So hit the one that's closest to perfection uh, to you. And the question is, whom did God give to you, right? That's the idea. Now, as we hit perfection, the problem is, again, like I told you, is that they do not understand Romans 14 deal. Everybody's uh, different spiritual convictions. So to avoid the dissension, so it's called perfection dissension, all right? Perfection, dissension. That's a problem, and that's a disease amongst Bible believers, all right? Because they have that perfect standard mindset, and then they're descending with everybody because they don't follow their spiritual convictions like the pastor does. Uh, that's a grave sin, all right? That's a horrible thing. I do not like that. It's a horrible thing. So when you go to Romans 14, the Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts and leads people differently. Our problem is, is that as Bible believers, we would rebuke, and we would criticize, think ill 
of the person whose spiritual conviction is different from us. Now, remember this. Let me repeat it again. A lot of people don't distinguish this, okay? But this is basic doctrine. I am not talking about wrong doctrine. Can I repeat that again? I'm not talking about wrong doctrine. I am talking about spiritual conviction. If there's a person whose doctrine is different from you, they're wrong. All right? They should be pointed out they're wrong. But if it's a spiritual conviction that's different, that's not doctrinally proven from the scripture, then you have to, uh, you have to tolerate that person's different spiritual conviction. But if I'm talking about a doctrine that's clear from the word of God, then yeah, if they're wrong, they're wrong. All right? So get that through your heads, all right? This is an advanced lesson, all right? So you have to distinguish at least the basic of the difference of doctrine and the difference of spiritual conviction. All right, now when we come to spiritual conviction right here, here's a Bible believer. He believes King James Bible is perfect. Dispensational salvation. Uh, All the right doctrines like you do. Then uh, maybe some minor ones, okay, rather than major ones, okay? That can happen. When you study that book so much, you can... Uh, see a lot more new doctrines or deeper doctrines, right? So if it comes to minor uh, doctrines, that's one thing. But if it's a major thing that Bible believers generally agree upon, then that's a major issue, right? You don't want to deviate from that. But anyway, that's the basic teaching, basic discipleship. Back to the main point is we tend to rebuke, criticize, think ill of a person whose spiritual conviction is different from us. Now, uh, you're in this crowd right here. And when you have that, you got to remember this. That's the reason why then the Lord is not going to bless your work. And that's the reason why when people look at your testimony, then they're going to be disgusted with your testimony. And people who are of wrong doctrine see Bible believers who believe in right doctrine fighting with each other. Come on. What do you think the people of wrong doctrine are going to do? That's right. Come on. They're going to end up the tolerating crowd then. They're going to end up with the ecumenical crowd. You're a horrible testimony by the believers on that one. You're all a horrible testimony on that. So we have to watch our testimony. The perfectionist crowd do not think of their testimony. They only think of their own perfect standards. That's it. That's good, preacher. They think. Didn't you know you could eat? Listen, you can even be right in your spiritual conviction. You might even teach the truth of it. You might be the one that's right, the other person that's wrong. But it won't do a hill of beans if you mishandle truth. What do I mean by that? You know the truth, you believe in truth, but can you handle the truth and use it well? All right? A gun is a gun. It can shoot, all right? But uh, you can mishandle a gun and then kill somebody and hurt somebody. That's right. And once the damage is done, you can't clean up the mess. So my point is this. When God has given you truth, this Bible-believing knowledge and stuff, the right spiritual conviction, how are you using that on others? You have to think about that. How are you using that on others? Is your testimony a good testimony in the eyes of the lost world? So when you do this, think of your testimony to others. When you keep in mind your testimony to others, it will shut your mouth many, many times, okay? That's just even common sense scenarios, to be honest. Here's an example. Here's a family member who's fighting with another family member, okay? They disagree with each other on something very strongly. When they get to a family get-together, all right? And then then here's uh, people within your household talking good about the family member you got in a deep fight with, all right? What are you going to do? Shout out uh, uh, all the ugly stuff that you and that other person were fighting about? No, that's common sense. You don't. Why? Because how you look in front of the rest of the people in the household. It's a stupid thing to do. You know what Bible believers are doing? They're doing that. They do that in their Bible-believing household where other people look at some other Bible-believing you're fighting with and then you shout out that other person and that does not look good for you. So you have to understand that. You have to look at your testimony. There are some uh, Bible-believing preachers who don't like me, and I don't like them, believe it or not. Why? Because it's inevitable. It's called reality. There are some people in my family I don't like, all right, and they don't like me. But that's inevitable. 
and so do you, okay? So do all of you. It's inevitable in life. So we always have to look at how our testimony looks to the eyes of the lost world when we come across these scenarios. If you think about testimony, trust me, you'll shut your mouth many times. A fool is counted wise when he shutteth his lips, yes? Mm -hmm. So to help you with uh, putting up with other people, you've got to shut your mouth. Now, how does this all relate to humility? See, the pro you notice right here the problem with these areas? This one is false humility and this one is pride. Do you see that? That's why you need to learn this lesson on humility. The problem with the tolerating crowd is that it's false humility. And the other, uh, the perfectionist crowd is pride. This is why this is an advanced lesson. A lot of people don't understand this. They don't know this. They don't learn this. Once you say stuff, you can't take back some of the stuff that you say. Amen. And the damage is done. Your testimony is ruined. When you always think about testimony, um, to be honest, this should be a very simple thing. If you think about this the most, the number one thing in your life, you'll know how to do this, and you'll know how to do this. When you're tolerating, how does your testimony look, right? When you're uh, dividing, uh, there's dissension, how does your testimony look, right? That's the most eye-opening thing is that when you think about testimony, then these two things would come out more correctly. Now, in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, notice that doctrine causes division. Romans 16, 17. Now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and what? Avoid. Not tolerate. Avoid. If there's someone teaching wrong doctrine, you should avoid. Uh, look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 7, Galatians chapter 5. We'll read verse 7. The Bible says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should, what? Not obey the truth. Now, uh, compare that. Let's see right here. Well, uh, we won't turn to this uh, other passage, but notice right here that uh, you have to follow the truth. When you follow the truth, Obviously, there are people who can hinder it, who can deviate you from it, and then uh, get you away from the truth. That's the reason why it's important in life to keep in mind truth divides. Truth divides, and doctrine can divide, so it should be done that way. That's the problem with the tolerating crowd. When it comes right here to spiritual conviction, now you have to keep in mind, right? When it comes to spiritual conviction, you have to keep in mind on, I cannot allow the division. I cannot allow a bad testimony. I must preserve it to the best of my ability. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about, now that we understand the toleration and then uh, the dissension aspects, this is getting all over the board again, so... Let me put a little bit of a line right here. Okay. Next thing we're going to be covering is actual dissension itself. When we cover the actual dissension, it takes a huge amount of humility to do this, which I'm still trying to do, and it's very difficult. The most dangerous thing is that if you know too much of that book, too much of truth, and yes, even too much of spiritual growth, spiritual uh, perfection, then your judgmental attitude and accusation of others increases tenfold. That's the problem with the perfectionist crowd. The problem with the perfectionist crowd is that the reason why there's always dissension and even bitterness against a person is because they have a higher standard than the other person or they think they have a higher standard than another person and that's one of the most dangerous things is that when you hit that perfectionist thing all right number one you have to be careful of this the reason why there's fights and then you have to realize in your humility level how really humble you are 
you should aim for a high standard, amen? Never wrong with that. You should do that. But when you aim for a high standard, you have to realize this. That's only to yourself, not to others. Can I repeat that again? The high standard is for you, not others. Why? Because how God dealt with you years. We're talking about years here. Years of how God guided you in your spiritual growth in life. That person did not have the luxury Amen. who went through those same steps and years like you do. That's you good. think you can tell that person in that's five minutes how on. to live your life? Hey, man, that's right. You cannot do that. And that is the problem of us perfectionist Bible believers. It's a horrible, dangerous thing, and that's why fights are really big. Because you expect that person to leap five minutes what took you ten years to do. Amen. Wow. That's the reason why there's fights. So then the standards should be yourself, not others. That's the reason why there's always fights amongst Bible believers. I mean, I'm not talking about the lost world. I'm talking about Bible believers. It's a horrible thing. Believe it or not, though, you'd be surprised. This is just general in life. Maybe the reason why your relationship, your marriage life is bad, you have this issue. Come on. Maybe the reason why there's dissension in your family is because you have this issue. Maybe the reason why you're a jerk to your neighbors or to your co-workers is not because you're taking a stand for the Lord. It's Come because on. you have this issue. It's good preaching, You'd be brother. surprised that this can be more general than you think. Not just amongst Bible believers. That's why they have this fight. This is going to be more general than you think. You have to look at your house life, your marriage life. How is that like? Here's another thing that I do not like about prideful people. The other problem with prideful people is how God blessed them. So then they're in such a position, listen, they're in such a position where everybody's looking up to them and they're right for doing so and they may be a leader, but that causes them with their position where they're enforcing their spiritual conviction on the other person when the Lord's dealing those other people differently. And when they enforce their spiritual conviction on that person, the people, rather than loving them, rather than respecting them, rather than following them, they just do it out of fear. Does your wife uh, obey you, husband, because of fear? I think that's an abusive husband then. That's not a loving husband. Do the members uh, serve you because out of their heart for the Lord or by fear? Um, you know, as I minister to these people, I never want to do it by fear. I want to do it because I earned your respect. I earned your respect. Now, should there be a level of fear? Of course. You know, if a child misbehaves, there should be a level of fear that mom and dad's going to discipline me, all right? If there's a problem going on in the church, the member should fear where the pastor is going to slam on all, all fours, and I won't hesitate to do it if there's a bit major issue. So there should be a level of fear, but the problem is, is that their lives are completely dictated by that, see? Their lives are dictated by fear that, why? Because of the person abusing their position and they think they're the Apostle Paul and everybody should follow their spiritual conviction. I hate that. I really despise that. If there's the number one thing that I don't want to become is this. All right, That is not even a Bible rule. That's just my own rule. I've seen that too much in my life. I refuse to become that. All right, I don't want to do that ever. So... When God blesses your life, you have to realize, why did God bless you? What put you there? See? It's because of God's gentleness and patience with you all that time. And you can't do that for other people. Come on. Uh, you forget the parable? Here's a servant who sinned against the master, right? In the parable, yeah. uh, owed him uh, probably a thousand stuff. And then the master, forget the Lord forgave the servant, right? Yeah. But then the servant did not forgive his other servant and then imprisoned him. What happened? The Lord got angry at that servant and condemned him. 
What the problem is with people who get blessed by God, God puts them at a position, is that they don't learn to shed that same gentleness and love and care to other people. And God dealt with you for years, man. Years, years, man. And then you have to do that same thing with other people. Never abuse your position, period. All right? Never ever do that. If I catch one of you people doing that because God blessed you and you have a talent to teach, preach, and stuff like that, I will slam on you on all fours. All right? Amen. I will. Because I hate this more than you do. I hate this more than you do. This is a guilty thing amongst Bible-believing pastors and leaders. I just hate it so much. I don't want to become like that. So they're not humble then, right? You notice that? They're not humble when they reach here. They're more like, you should listen to me. Because God is using me and I hate that. Alright? Number three. Alright, help me Lord. All right. The reason why I'm saying help me Lord is because... Um, there are some of my weaknesses here that I'm talking about, actually. So this is a good lesson, all right? Uh, this number two thing is not me, obviously. I have a total uh, spite against number two. But anything, everything else, I get that. All right, here's number three concerning about fights. Uh, when you deal with fights, sometimes you have to, uh, when you deal with these fighting scenarios, you always have to come out the mature one at the end. Um, actually, at the beginning to end. This is an extremely hard part. Okay. Whenever you fight with someone, all right? Why do you fight? Because so-and-so started it, right? Mm. It's always that way, all right? That's, a, that's not a... Grown adults even still do that. But that's something even little children do. Yeah. And what the problem is, we still have this immature mindset, grown adults. That is a horrible... Okay, I don't care who started the first fight, all right? Problem is, you have to be the mature one at the end, all right? Well, my husband's not doing his side of the bargain. My wife's not doing her side of the bargain. Uh, pastor's not doing his job right. The member's not doing uh, his or her job right. It don't matter, fool. All right? It don't matter. Why do I say fool? Because that's the reason why everyone gets in a fight. No one is willing to take the first step to be the mature person. That's my point. All right? No one wants that. All right? They want to be right in the end for their anger, for their bitterness, for their argument. If you stay, if you insist on that way, you will never resolve a fight. And that is a childish mentality to do it. You will never progress. Amen. You have to start mature at the end. So what if the person says something wrong to you at the beginning? You still got to hold back the anger and you got to pray to the Lord. Amen. Now, I wonder if you're mature enough to do that. For you forgot, right? Or you don't think about it? So you always have to, uh, you always have to swallow and pray and think always at the beginning. You always have to do that. Lord, what's the right thing to do in this scenario? You ever do that? Before you give out the first uh, remark or the first thing that might just explode a dynamite, mm -hmm. you Go always on. have to do that first. What's the right thing to say and to do, Lord? When you do that, 100% of the time, it should come out right. Praise God. 100% of the time, it should come out right. It always did with me. But why is it that I still have uh, issues? It's because I don't do that. Come because on. my flesh wants to say something first. Go by my wisdom, my patience level, see? How hurt I'm feeling and how much I want to say. That is a fleshly thing. All right? You always have to shut your mouth. A fool is counted wise when he shut it his lip. And you always have to pray and then say, Lord, what's the right thing to say and to do first? You always do that first. Now, as you do that, the Lord's going to give you the first thing to say, all right? The Lord's going to give you wisdom, all right? So when you're mature at the first to the end, it's prayer, and then you have to think, all right? You have to think. You have to use your head, okay? What's the wise thing to do, all right? 
or it's going to give you wisdom. You know what we always do in a fight? We go by feelings. We always go by feelings. We're, we, we boast ourselves to be Bible believer. We know right doctrine. But all that knowledge you know, instead of going by what you know, you mostly go by feelings. I know that. That's right. When you go by feelings, oh, you misuse the knowledge and the truth. Wow. And you use that truth to hurt somebody. Yeah, guilty. That's right. So that's a horrible thing. Final authority for us Bible believers is not that King James Bible, no matter how high your spiritual standard is. One thing I learned is all flesh is as grass. Everyone goes by feelings at the end yeah. and at the beginning. We're always a feeling people. You're no different from a charismatic buddy going by feelings as final authority. Good preacher. So, be, uh, so you always have to pray, think wisdom, and feelings must die. Why? Because the flesh must die. Isn't that a basic lesson you learned in disciple, basic discipleship? What should you do with the flesh? Crucify it. Kill it. It must die. Why? Because I promise you this. When you argue, no one cares about your feelings. Right. Can I repeat that again? When you fight, they don't care how you feel. Yeah, they want to be rich. You know why? The other person is only thinking about... <laughs> can you guess? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, his or her own feelings. Yeah. <laughs> then it's a feeling world we get in. And when you get a black feeling versus a, you know, a yellow feeling right here, and they're going like this, then these colors are not going to mesh, and it's always an opposite color that always... Oh, Join my feelings here. They're not going to join your feelings, all right? They want you to join their feelings. That's why you, do you see why counseling is such a turmoil? Psychology is such a turmoil? You go by whatever the client's feeling. Feelings must die. And you got to pray, you got to think, you got to use wisdom. So feelings are hard to control. They're hard to crucify. So you need to pray. You always have to pray it out, even if you don't want to. Right. Even if you don't want to and the feelings don't want to, you have to at least say, God, I don't want to. Help yeah. me. You yeah. need to at least give something short like that. That's That's right. You have to fight against those feelings. Otherwise, it's going to mess up. Now, when you do that at the beginning, this is so important. you got to endure to the end. Isn't that for tribulation? Well, I'm going to apply it right here. All right? For the church age, you need to endure to the end. All right? You might say, why should I endure to the end? Because when you do that the first time, the other side is not going to listen to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other side won't listen to you no matter what. The other side, what's going to happen is the other side will continue to fight back. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so important. You've got to stay mature from beginning to end. Well, I'm not good at that, Pastor. Good. You're humble. Right. Why don't you admit you're not perfect now and say you're flesh? That's right. Finally, can you admit that you're flesh? You're all about feeling. No, you're spiritually perfect, right? People should listen to you. They should understand what you're saying. Well, reality is people don't, all right? They're not in your brain. They don't know what God gave to you. They don't know what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and they don't know the years of journey God dealt with you in your experience. So you have to get it through your thick head, all right? You have to get it through your thick head, that the other person will always be different from you. So you have to be the one who's level-headed and cool and mature from beginning to the end. You want to end well. Not just start well, you want to end it well. That's right, bro. Let that person be the immature one. Let that person be the guilty one. Let that person be the bitter one. But never you. Never you. You know what's powerful about it? I'll tell you what's powerful about it. You created your testimony. Amen. Amen. That person may be bitter at you, yeah. and I've seen it in families. You can even get a home in a family where a child might run away, be the angry one, be bitter, all right, and then uh, think ill of you from beginning to end. But your testimony, they've seen it. That's right. How mature you were, cool-headed, how you were compassionate, loving, and how you try to do it right. They cannot forget that. And what's going to happen is that will bother them. And what they're going to do is they'll either do a couple things. One, they'll keep finding stuff to blame you. Because why? That guilt is eating them. That's making them upset. 
Or number two, it, they're going to be guilty and they won't apologize. They might half apologize or they'll calm down and half make up with you. Or three, three, they will fully repent, all right? Which is probably a 10% possibility, right? You know what I'm talking about? All right? 10%. I mean, no one's going to say, I'm sorry, I was the one who was wrong at the end, all right? That's a 10% possibility. The fourth thing is God will use your testimony against them at the judgment seat of Christ. But remember this, where you failed in your flesh too, God will use that against you right. at the judgment seat of Christ. One thing I learned about fights, it's always two parties, two people's problem. Always. Right. No matter how perfect you are, including yours truly. I've learned that. It's always, uh, it's always two. All right? It's always two, no matter how right you are. So it's important when you do that, your testimony will stand out. And you will win at the end. And the Lord will use it. So always think about that. And then that's what? Humility. That's not about me being right. I'll tell you what pride is, all right? Simple, all right? Pride is about me, right? Me, 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 me. Right here is right. Me, right. That's right. I can look at me right, me right, me right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm feeling right, this is the right feeling, I deserve yeah. to be mad at you, I deserve Kick to be bitter, that, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't care how right you are, that's your flesh. Yeah. That's your flesh, it's a sin, you need to repent, you need to get that right with God, okay? Amen. Otherwise, if you don't do that, I told you, is, you think this is basic discipleship now you're hearing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, this is called advanced for a reason. Yeah. Why? Because this is heavy. Now, if this feels so heavy to you, well, I'm telling you, basically, uh, one hour teaching from, what, maybe 12 years of my ministry? Yeah. This is called advanced lesson, right? See? So, a lot of it is myself right here. So, it's so important you've got to get this out of the way. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. Who is it about? Did you forget? Yeah, Jesus Christ. You forgot? That's the basic of all basics. It's about Jesus. So when you're doing this, what are you always having in your mind? It's about Jesus. It's about what God wants. Not what I want, not how I feel. It's a matter of what Jesus wants, Jesus wants, Jesus wants. I promise you this. When you do what Jesus wants, in the end, it will come out in a way where you will be happy. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise. And you can live more happily than ever before. Only if you put Jesus Christ in your mind and not you. Okay? Because God does care about your feelings. Yeah. Out of everyone in the argument, God cares about your feelings. Wow, sometimes you don't. Sometimes, right. sometimes you don't care about your feelings. Come on. Sometimes you don't know your feelings well, like God does. God cares about your feelings. So he knows what's best for you. What would feel the great and the best is when you follow his will. All right? At the beginning, it feels like crud, it feels like awful, it feels like I hate this, you know, but at the end, you're going to be happy. And those kind of feelings are positive feelings, makes you feel good, all right? Nothing like living right for the Lord. Nothing like living right for the Lord, okay? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and eye-opening. Yeah. I pray Thank that we Lord. have uh, truly raised our discipleship to a whole nother bar and level in advance that will please you and honor you and not ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.